All right, welcome everyone. So today it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and good friend, uh, Professor Judd Reedy. Uh, Dr. Reedy is the Deputy Director for the Georgia Tech Institute for Materials, and he's the Associate Director for the Center for Space Technology and Research. He's been an adjunct uh, professor in the School of Materials Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech and a principal research engineer at the Georgia Tech Research Institute for many years. Uh, prior to joining Georgia Tech, uh, he worked for a major military contractor, General Dynamics, as well as in small business. Um, and he has served as the PI or co-PI for grants totaling uh, tens of millions of dollars from a variety of government and industry sources. He is currently the Vice President of the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society, which is a rotating position that uh, he will eventually be the, the president in a, in a couple of years. His current research focuses primarily on energy, aerospace, and nanomaterial applications and electronics reliability, and he's going to talk today about lunar flashlight. So look forward to hearing from you, Judd. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate that. I need to update my bio. I actually became president back in March, so I've been president for just slightly over two months now. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Yep. So let me share my screen. Yes, it's coming through. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so my talk is about the exploration of the moon. The moon is easily the most explored um, and observed article in the sky. Um, been looking at it for hundreds of thousands of years um, since man first began to walk walk around and even probably before that. Um, and we got very uh, intimate with the moon, but with the Apollo missions, um, actually walking on the moon, um, I think the exploration of the moon would be a lot different today if we had known um, the water resources that we've since um, discovered there. Um, if we knew them at the time, uh, exploration would have turned out a lot different um, because the science value of the water on the moon is um, of, of great importance. It's primordial water as opposed to water on earth that has gone through uh, the water cycle numerous times, gone through our, our bodies. Um, the, the water on the moon is um, original water from comets. Um, it can potentially be from the impact that created the uh, moon itself. Uh, it can also be uh, perhaps created through uh, protons bombarding the surface, the hydrogen, um, and liberating oxygens and, and creating H2O. But really, the, the interest in the water is more the economic um, value and, and the use, utilization of it for exploration, um, both drinking um, water for the astronauts as well as for um, plants and crops and fish if we happen to go that route. Um, and then uh, probably more important than all of those is that you can turn it into rocket fuel, uh, oxidizer and, and fuel to um, either go back to Earth from the moon, uh, to go to uh, orbit around the um, moon, to hop to different places on the moon uh, and interplanetary exploration. So like going to Mars or something like that. Um, so as most of us know, the moon has a 28 day cycle, two weeks of sun, two weeks of shadow, um, except for at the South Pole. If we look down at the South Pole, there's regions where um, the sun never shines. These are called PSRs, permanently shaded regions inside the craters. And then right next door are areas where the sun always shines. And it might be hard to follow those shadows around. I'm not sure if the video plays well. So we'll highlight the areas where it stays permanently shaded. And so that um, combined area on, on the lunar poles where um, these areas have been in shade for, for billions of years um, is about 10 to the fifth square kilometers. Um, I meant to look up the area of Taiwan um, to see how many Taiwans that is. Uh, that's roughly the size of Virginia in the United States if you've ever been um, to that fine state. Uh, one thing we don't know though, is um, uh, if there are water resources there, uh, what, what the thickness is. Is it like surface frost or is it like glacier thick or is it mixed in with the regolith kind of like permafrost? Um, but all this knowledge that we have 
today really began in 1998 with Lunar Prospector and continued through a series of different observations that saw indirect evidence that um, something was going on in these permanently shaded regions, whether it was related to the, um, the neutron density, um, uh, enhanced hydrogen content or whatnot. All of these were, were indirect measurements. Uh, and again, uh, other ones where, where you look at the reflectivity, uh, the albedo and other, other measurements, encourage you to review the various different um, literature that, that's very compelling, um, but it's all indirect. Um, lunar flashlight um, will provide direct the evidence. Plan for construction on the moon. We'll need water to watch that. Transporting the water. The, the screen is all dark. It, it's supposed to be like that. Is it? It should be playing a video. Okay. Right. Yeah, I can see the movie, so it might just be a video. Going all the way to Taiwan, maybe a challenge. <clears throat> the video, the audio is pretty garbled, though, Judd. Yeah. Well, we can skip that. That one is um, actually available online, that video, uh, and I'll put that in the chat box. Um, at the end of the end of the talk, I'll, I'll grab it real quick. Um, but the the spacecraft itself uh, is what's known as a six U. U is a uh, universal unit um, developed, I believe, by Caltech. That's ten centimeters by ten centimeters by ten centimeters. So ours are um, is a thirty by twenty by ten um, cube or rec rectangular like structure. Um, and I thought it'd be helpful to, to bring the spacecraft along and show it to you. Um, so this is actually a 3D printed model. Don't freak out, Glenn. It's not the actual spacecraft. Um, and, but amazingly realistic. It's about a 90% model. So I'm going to use this to kind of show you um, what's going to happen as, as we're going, going along. But when it's inside the dispenser, it'll be like this. There will be solar panels on all, all the sides, uh, except for back here, which is where the thrusters are. And then as it comes out of the dispenser uh, on the way to the moon, uh, the solar panels on the flat sides, the, the, the larger sides, will open automatically um, with, with, with springs and they'll, they'll deploy on their own. The solar panels on the skinnier side uh, are trifolds uh, and they actually deploy using what's known as a burn wire that will pass a current through there. Once it deploys, uh, out almost immediately afterwards to to uh, to gen to create the the full um, power generating structure on the uh, on the hey, space. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but you'll you want to hold that up in front of your face because when you're it's below you we can't see it up here. Yes, that's great. Got it. So different shapes. We'll refer back to this a number of times. So don't don't fret. You'll see it again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so it's weighs about 14 kilograms. Um, if you add it up all, it, it's a seven year project that started out of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, if you added up all the contracts there, which they had to do to insure it, it'd be a fairly expensive mission. Um, I should have updated this uh, next line uh, because just a few days ago, uh, we got the actual launch date. The launch date is now December 27th. Uh, it will be going now on a Falcon 9 rocket out of Cape Canaveral, Florida. Uh, it was originally slated to go on the new NASA, uh, what's called the SLS, uh, Space Launch System rocket. Um, but where it would have had to go inside that stack of a rocket is between two very large sections of the rocket. Uh, and that stacking process, we would have had to have the spacecraft fueled and down to the Cape uh, by like September of, of last, last year. And we didn't get the uh, the components to begin integrating it and build the spacecraft entire in its entirety until like June. So there just wasn't enough time. Um, and frankly, I would rather be on the Falcon 9 anyway, because uh, Falcon 9's flown a bunch of times. SLS has never flown. Um, the key things about this mission is it's actually a technology demonstrator. I talked earlier about the science involved about studying finding water on water ice on the moon, uh, but that's that's kind of secondary. Uh, that's it's a great mission, obviously, uh, but the technology demonstration of these rocket thrusters, the chemical propulsion, 
elements of the spacecraft allows this spacecraft to go into orbit around the, the moon. Um, no other CubeSat has ever orbited any other celestial body other than the Earth. Um, one CubeSat did go zooming past Mars, um, but it did not enter orbit around Mars. Um, so this will be the first, first one to demonstrate what's known as a near rectilinear halo orbit. Um, that is a, we would call that a polar orbit kind of on Earth. Um, and so it passes very close to the South Pole and has a, a, about a week, week period. Um, the, the, the proximity it is to the South Pole gives us about three minutes um, to do our observations. So that's pretty quick. And then the rest of the week <laughs> is doing something entirely, you know, it's going around, it's charging its batteries, it's communicating with Earth. Um, but three minutes of terror uh, as it zooms across. We hope to get 10 orbits, um, science orbits out of the mission. Um, and assuming it's still working, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do additional orbits after that. The other technology demonstration are the lasers involved. So the way this will work, and you can see the picture, it's got what looks like a laser shooting at the moon with the earth in the background, is there's a window right here that has four lasers that come out at four different wavelengths uh, of light, roughly between uh, one and two, two microns. Uh, and it goes off, it hits the moon, and it bounces back, and the lasers fire in sequence. So boom, 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 boom like that uh, for those three minutes. And so it bounces off, and then the, the very faint signal comes back and goes into the detector. Um, so these are infrared um, lasers. So we have to make sure that the detector is very, very cool uh, and, and is, is chilled to allow us to, to tease out the signal uh, from the noise. But the idea is that these different wavelengths of light, when they reflect off a of regolith versus water ice versus perhaps carbon dioxide ice versus say maybe ammonia ice, all sorts of different ices will have different um, reflection properties. And so we'll hope to be able to see that. Um, this is the um, breakdown of all the different bits and pieces that, uh, that go into this. Um, basically, this spacecraft arrived at Georgia Tech as a box of parts uh, with wires hanging out of it and very little documentation, quite frankly. Um, the Georgia Tech contribution that Glenn Lightsey did actually is the propulsion unit itself. So that's this part of the spacecraft here. The, what we call the upper spacecraft is what um, NASA JPL built. And that had, that's the part um, that you see a, a great many of the arrows on. So that's this part up here at the top. And so it's got the radios, it's got the lasers, reaction wheels, um, batteries, those types of things, the communication systems. Um, and so we attached a variety of sun sensors and other things to that aspect. It also has a very nice um, X-band radio on it to communicate. So we will communicate uh, from Georgia Tech campus um, to, to the spacecraft using X-band, using the deep space network. Um, and uh, that's, that's going to be really exciting, quite, quite frankly. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the laser aspect. And so there's a variety of really interesting things on here. For, for one, um, is we have to cool it down quite a bit. So there's a couple ways that we cool it because the spacecraft is just packed full. And I'll show you a picture later on that is, shows the insides of it. But there's no room for an active cooling system, a uh, cryo cooler or something like that. So we have to figure out ways to, to cool the detector. Uh, one is this uh, radiator on the end here. Um, that radiates into deep space, but there's also what's known as a phase change material, a PCM, inside it that is a, it's a paraffin, uh, like a, a wax-like material almost, um, that uh, it changes, changes phase, a solid to a different, different solid, to um, help remove some of that thermal energy. Uh, it also has uh, very nice batteries in it. Um, the difference between the, we've got two sets of batteries. We've got one set of batteries, for the spacecraft itself, for the communications and that sort of thing that are charged from the solar panels, and then another set of batteries for the lasers. 
reason we have two different ones is the batteries for the spacecraft, uh, we, we don't want to drive those down to, to near zero um, because then you got to charge it up and you run into a whole lot of risks that they might not charge back up and then you can't talk to your spacecraft. On the lasers, on the other hand, we want to, these are very powerful lasers, 25 watt uh, infrared lasers, uh, each one, four of those that will suck these batteries dry quickly in this three minutes. And so we spend a good bit of time uh, outside of that low pass recharging the batteries uh, to allow them to be fully charged uh, to use them again on the next orbit. The, the propulsion unit itself uses a, a new fuel. Um, it's what's called Ascent. It was developed um, by the Air Force here at, in the United States. It is what we call a green propellant. Um, and green is kind of a relative term. Most monopropellants, uh, the, the most common monopropellant in nowadays is hydrazine. And a monopropellant has both oxidizer and um, fuel mixed in together, which makes it pretty dangerous so that when you, when you elevate the temperature, they dissociate and react and boom, uh, you've got rocket thrust. Uh, here, uh, it's also has the same thing, oxidizers and fuel uh, together. Uh, but it's not, not nearly as toxic as hydrazine. Hydrazine is very, very bad. Um, and, and this, now you wouldn't want to drink this, I mean, but, but it's, it's not as, as super toxic as, as the hydrazine. Um, the whole structure itself, uh, the fuel tank, which is down here, and then the, 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 the systems and the valves uh, was designed by Glenn Lysey's group. Uh, it had to fit an existing form factor. Uh, Georgia Tech actually came in and saved the day on this particular project. The, a previous contractor was doing the, um, the propulsion unit, and when they took it to do what's called the TVAC, the thermal vacuum, um, it, it puffed up, it, it, it expanded, uh, and kind of became spherical as opposed to rectangular. Uh, and that's no good, of course. And so they, they eventually uh, got cut from the program and Glenn Lightsey came in and redesigned the whole thruster, even though it looks exactly like uh, the other one. Uh, just this one didn't pop, pop up during our thermal vacuum, thankfully, Glenn. Um, here's a close up of the thrusters. Again, these are very, very tiny things. You can see them here. This is about a 90% model. So they're a little bit bigger than this, but you can see really tiny throats and whatnot. Uh, this is a movie and I don't think my movies work very well um, going overseas. So we'll just go real quick through this, but you can see this, I'm a material scientist uh, by training and this was my first chance to work with rhenium ever. Um, so really happy to use that element of the periodic table finally. Um, but it's a high temperature refractory um, metal. Um, so anyway, so I said it arrives as a box of parts and that's really what, what it looked like. Um, so we brought the propulsion unit over from Glenn's lab to my lab at, um, at what's called uh, Georgia Tech Research Institute, which is the applied research arm of Georgia Tech. Um, NASA JPL provided what we call the upper spacecraft. Again, that's got the computers in it, the radios, the lasers, batteries, and things like that. And then the solar arrays are COTS, basically store-bought um, from two different vendors. Um, and these are some of the other uh, parts that were in that box. Um, and our contract was to integrate it, uh, to put it all together and make it work. Um, and so we, um, we took the, the documentation that was available. Glenn, of course, had a lot of really good documentation on the propulsion system. That's very well understood. Um, but we had to, had to work, physically write the, the procedures to um, how to put it together. And then we actually would put it together following our own procedures. And then we check to make sure we put it together right. Um, these are some of the, the, the images of the different types of batteries we have. I apologize that I did not put scale bars on here. Uh, these the batteries are roughly the size of a, what we would call a double A battery in the United States. But again, two different types of batteries, uh, one for the spacecraft itself and others for the, for the lasers. Uh, we're always gonna be recharging draining the laser batteries. Uh, we really don't want to drain the uh, spacecraft batteries down quite that low. We will drain them during high um, power situations, for instance, the communication. Um, 
draws a quite a bit of, of juice from the batteries. These are the X-band antennas, both receive and transmit. We've got them on the spacecraft on two different faces. So down here, right here and here, transmit and receive. And then also on the other side, right here, transmit and receive. Uh, here's uh, some examples of the, the solar cells, both the, the not the trifold ones as well as the the planar one excuse me those other ones planners here's here's the trifold ones um and so we had to put it together and make it look like this we had a great um cad diagram of it so that that helped tremendously one thing i really want to encourage all the cad designers out there to pay particular attention to the fact that there's there's wires like this cad drawing doesn't have any wires anywhere but you saw earlier that there's a whole bunch of wires hanging off of all the different parts. And so we had, you, you have to put this thing together and the wires have to go through places where there was zero clearance. Uh, and so uh, we had to do some additional machining to some of the parts that we were assured would all fit together um, just like they designed, but really didn't uh, to, to make some places for the wires uh, to go through. Um, but it will enter into this, uh, what we would call a polar orbit on, on Earth. Uh, it's, it's actually very elliptical as opposed to what you may or may not be able to see in the um, animation there. But the measurement goal is that we will zoom across the South Pole, roughly um, 10 kilometers or so above the, the pole, and the lasers will fire sequentially, boom, 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 boom. And that will, um, go down, illuminate whatever's in these craters, that light will bounce back and we'll detect it. Uh, and so that'll just give us a line spectrum. If, you know, we're following a straight line. And so we'll be able to see um, the peaks where we've got uh, ho hopefully water ice, perhaps other ices, and then also of course, uh, no ice like the re exposed regolith. And then if we do this enough times across the same crater and other craters nearby, we'll actually create maps. Um, and those will be very, very primitive maps. Um, in the United States, we had uh, Lewis and Clark were uh, some early explorers. So this will be a very Lewis and Clark-like map. Not very good at all when you compare it to today's GPS maps. Um, but it was the best we had back in the day. And, and that started the ability to explore, which is exactly what we hope to do with the lunar flashlight, is to provide a good mapping of the water resource uh, on the moon. Um, here's a bit more on the um, on the lasers in, involved. So they fire in six millisecond pulses. Uh, it takes about uh, 50 or so milliseconds to, it depends on our height uh, or altitude, to go to the base of the crater and reflect back. And we, we just do this for, the, for approximately three minutes as we go, go across. And by having, we could do this with just one laser, but by having multiple wavelengths, we're able to disambiguate, is it water ice versus CO2 ice? Because we've got the different lasers, for instance, uh, the, the red color here is located at a peak, um, uh, absorption peak associated with water, whereas the yellow, is that a plateau region is not. And again, the green is located at an absorption peak, whereas the blue is again located at a plateau. And so you can ratio those, these two against each other and understand uh, aspects related to the water um, or other things that are reflecting. Uh, the goal is to have this uh, map, the pixel size, if you will, be at like one or two kilometers resolution. So size of a large football field or, or large uh, soccer stadium. Um, and that, that's, that's an operationally useful. The current, current maps that I showed earlier, these are tens of kilometers pixels. So it's not clear exactly where within that giant 10 kilometer range this, this water is coming from. Is it scattered uh, completely across it or is it clustered in, in one particular corner? So we, we hope to have much, much better finer resolution um, and then we will correlate what we find there with other craters, for instance, that we have, would 
did not observe to see if there might be other places uh, where the water ice may be. Um, it's hard to see on this image in the upper right concerning the, um, the South Pole, but there's little lines on here. So 10, 10 different lines representing 10 different perspective orbits or science orbits across there. And what I want you to take from this is that really no matter which way that we fly across this map, um, we're always going across some craters. That's this area below this line. So where these filled in areas are, are different craters. And so they're different depths, different volumes and whatnot. And so we'll, we'll, we'll have to see when we exactly launch and uh, these other things, but we will adjust the orbit to try and get the best data uh, that we can. And, and, and that's uh, completely due to the, the, the benefit of Glenn's rocket engine on the back of the spacecraft. Um, like I said, this is not a Georgia Tech project uh, originally. We were part of a large team. Uh, it was originated at, out of uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Um, <laughs> many of the, and, and you see all the, the, the many names on here, we've worked with all these people and they're all just wonderful uh, friends now and, and great people to work with. Um, but a lot of them were, I mean, they were all at JPL originally, and then they kind of scattered to the winds and taken jobs elsewhere. For instance, um, Barbara Cohen, who's the science lead, has gone to UCLA, uh, but there's also work going on at University of Colorado um, and also at, uh, at Johns Hopkins um, University as well. So it's, it's really a, a broad-based effort. What Georgia Tech was responsible for, what I'm responsible for is taking that box of parts, putting it together, testing it, shaking it, baking it, firing the um, lasers, testing the radios, making sure it works on the ground um, so that when Glenn, so that once we launch it, Glenn becomes responsible for the op actual operations, uh, which is nominally an 18 month mission uh, from launch through the 10 science orbits. Hopefully we'll get some more, but ultimately we have to dispose of the spacecraft, um, which is going to smash into the moon um, and create our own little crater. Now we have to be really careful not to smash it into the water ice. We don't want to contaminate this water ice that has not seen anything for 4 billion years. The last thing we want to do is dump some leftover rocket fuel uh, in there. So we will, Glenn will be very careful uh, to create our own little crater and we're going to name it after a famous student uh, at Georgia Tech. We're going to call it the uh, George P. Burdell uh, crater, if I had my way with it. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Atlanta. <laughs> Perhaps you've been to our airport, um, which is down there at the, the, the bottom, 6 o'clock on the, on the clock face, if you will. Um, Georgia Tech uh, proper is located right in the middle of, of that circle. Uh, so Glenn, his facility is what's known as the ESM building. My building is what's known as the Baker building. Um, we're, what, maybe a quarter mile away from each other, perhaps, if we walk, Glenn. It's not particularly far. Um, and the rest of the work is done at our uh, auxiliary facility that is um, roughly 13 miles away. Um, and we've got a, 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 it's about a million square feet of additional campus space um, that, that Georgia Tech Research is, is performed uh, up there as well. And so we did both the vibe table and the um, making sure it was self compatible with anechoic chambers up there. On campus, in my building, we have created. Um, a clean room space that we call C shaft it stands for the center for space hardware assembly fabrication and testing. And so we've got a variety of tools there where we can create circuit boards. We can have uh, you know, floating tables so that we can put it all together inspection stations to, to look at things with microscopes. Uh, we've, we're getting a new uh, thermal vacuum. We had to go across campus to use Glenn's thermal vacuum. Um, but we're getting a, a, a a stronger one and a slightly bigger one as well so that we continue continue that work. Other capabilities that we've got on campus uh, are the Missions Operations Center, which is where Glenn 
Glenn's students and the researchers that work for him will be controlling the spacecraft. It's in a really neat space. It's in a very old building, uh, possibly almost the oldest building on campus, like 1800s type building. And it's in the attic, old attic of that. And it's just a really neat dichotomy to see the really ancient oak timbers, um, really stout wood um, juxtaposed <laughs> with the deep space network um, and, and other telemetry coming across on the screen. It's just the old and the new right next to each other just makes it it's a really cool feeling. Um, the facilities that we have up at Cobb County include the, the vibration table as well as an S-band um, ground station. We're not using the S-band on this one, remember, we're communicating in X-band, but the S-band for radio communication is very useful for other CubeSats. So if you're wanting to partner with Georgia Tech to um, create CubeSats uh, or, or larger satellites, We've got the ability to communicate now in, in a variety of different, very useful frequencies. We also have UHF and VHF as well. Uh, we've got a multitude of EMI chambers. These are anechoic chambers that we do um, a variety of, of radar and uh, a lot other uh, RF work at, at G2I. Um, and then of course there's Glenn's uh, thermal vacuum. So we had a lot of stuff to do. I don't expect you to read this um, chart, but what I want you to understand is that it was a partnership with J JPL, that JPL would bring the spacecraft parts to Georgia Tech. We would put it together with their assistance. Um, they would take over some things, uh, for instance, the sun sensor and star tracker were items that they just could not get done in time when everything was out at Pasadena, uh, testing those. So, so they kind of kick that can down the road, if that analogy translates as well, um, and, and did that here. Uh, ultimately, we get the whole thing together, which we have done now. The only aspects we have remaining are to put on the final flight software. Uh, we've identified a few things during testing um, that, that make us know that we need to reprogram a few things uh, as far as sequences of, of not turning on the radios so too fast, for instance. Uh, but ultimately, um, we'll get the software loaded. We will ship it, um, drive it uh, to a different state in, in the United States called Alabama. We will fuel it at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and then, then the spacecraft is a bomb, basically. I mean, it's got uh, very energetic fuel inside of it. And so um, we want to be very careful with it once it's fueled uh, and really won't do anything further with it other than remove before flight various items and lens covers and, and uh, unscrew a few screws and things like that and do a functional check. We're really not going to exercise it too, too much. Uh, we'll exercise it a lot beforehand, but once it's fueled, uh, we'll just do a few quick checks, make sure it's still good. Then we'll go off to uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida where uh, it'll get mounted to this Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, we fuel it about two months before um, the, the launch. So we'll be fueling it, um, nominally in October of this year, uh, with a launch again, uh, slated for December, uh, 20, it's a three day launch window. Um, so, um, all right. So here is, here is the spacecraft, a picture of it. Um, let's see if you can see my mouse. So these vertical slice things right here, are the various different avionics, like the flight computer, the radio, um, the power control system, and, and all the things that, that make all the different pieces talk to each other okay. Um, the, uh, the flight control system, the, the, the exact is here. I showed you previously the laser um, receiver. It's covered up with Kapton tape to keep stuff from falling inside of it. The lasers are over here in this small box here. Uh, the batteries go, would go, or weren't in here yet, but they would go in this open slot here. And like I said, you see a whole bunch of wires and stuff like that, which were not on the CAD diagram. So make sure you include space for that next time. Um, this is looking at the, um, this face of the spacecraft and this particular item here, the radiator is a troublemaker on the spacecraft because um, 
when we it's on it's part of the upper spacecraft and we were assured that everything was was right um but the problem was this was actually uh what was called an exceedance so it was actually out um not much 40 thousandths of an inch i think was the amount but enough so that when this gets pushed out of the dispenser the the plate that pushes on it is a spring load should push along the perimeter here along the frame but instead with the radiator sticking out it would have pushed on the radiator instead and if it pushes on the radiator there's a post behind the radiator that attaches to our detector and so we would have knocked the detector out of alignment immediately right upon dispensing and, and then that's no good uh, but fortunately we caught that um, fixed the mistake um, that was given to us uh, and now we're that, that part we, we don't have to worry about this is um, circling just various key components the red circles highlight the rhenium thrusters that use this ascent fuel the green circles are our receive and transmit x-band antennas the blue circle is a, a sun sensor we've got sun sensors on a variety of different faces you see that one there so that one is, is th this one um, but there are there's one up here there's another one over here and i think that's it and so we took this box of parts and we put it together and tested it um, one of the challenges with this spacecraft unlike here where i'm putting it down on my desk all the time the actual spacecraft has solar panels now over all the different sides uh, and then rocket engines on this side so there's really nowhere to put it down uh, you can't put it down because you don't want to put it on down on this on the solar cells um, so we have to only hold it on these little tiny rails all around the edge of it and so we use this thing called the dreadnought um, which is down here and you can see it a still picture here and this was we didn't come up with the name dreadnought um, this was just some um, rocket scientists over at Marshall Space Flight Center that came up with that that name because he thought it looked like the old German dreadnoughts or the Star Star Wars dreadnought or something like that whatever the point of it is that it allows us to take the spacecraft and turn it up on its end and to, to adjust it from laying flat to, to lying vertical for instance where you see over here we have to have it in a vertical configuration to allow us to fire the lasers. Um, this is a beam dump because uh, these are crazy strong lasers. Um, the other, um, but but when we're pro when we're putting the spacecraft together, integrating it, it's usually uh, it's usually in the horizontal configuration like that. I am ready. Um, once it gets all together, we go and do the different um, uh, deployment mechanisms. So this is demonstrating, hopefully you can see it on your end, the different solar panels um, deploying. I apologize for this last one. I forgot to edit, edit this. But so the, the top one up here that played is is where they um, they just deploy on their own during the dispensing. This other one, we have to pass a current through the burn wire and it has to be commanded. Um, and so there you see it pops out like that. And it looks like a real spaceship uh, when it is all fully deployed. It's, it's a beautiful sight. Um, really like looking at it and uh, can't wait to hopefully see it uh, in orbit as it gets uh, dispensed out of the Falcon 9. There should be some imagery that hopefully we'll see it um we had to check to make sure that once we put it all together as it had traveled around and we moved it around um the georgia tech fair amount to to make sure that the laser alignment was still um still worked and it did then we took it put it in a car drove it 13 miles away to our our vibe facility uh and and shook the heck out of it um at, and this was actually a really critical time during the integration because right when we were getting ready to do this was when they were trying to make the decision between what rocket we're going to be on because the sls rocket and the falcon 9 rocket uh shake differently when they launch 
So they have different uh, frequencies of, of vibration. And so you have to input that frequency when you're doing this test. And you don't want to test it using the SLS frequency when you're actually launching on the Falcon 9. Uh, so that was a kind of a critical gate, if you will, uh, during the integration of it. Uh, so we tested it to the Falcon 9 specs, uh, and it shook just fine, and it's good. Uh, then we took it uh, across the hall to our anechoic chamber and commanded the radios um, to, to communicate through the antennas. We did this so that to make sure that it would not um, basically deafen itself and, 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 and blind itself with its own emissions by, by just drowning out its receivers because there's times where we want to send and receive data at the same time. Um, and so had to make sure that it was self-compatible. And it is. Uh, after we did all this shaking on it, we wanted to check, hey, did we shake the lasers out of alignment on this or is it still gonna work uh, after our simulated launch? And they did shift a tiny bit, um, not precisely in the center anymore, uh, but well, well, well within the limits uh, of, of what we require um, for the to get the science science data. So, still works. This was one of the funner tests that that we had. Um, so I told you about all the sun sensors that are on a variety of different places here and over here and down here and over here. And those, when the sun is on that side, send signals to the computer to say that, hey, the sun is over here. And so we have to simulate that instead of taking our spacecraft outside the clean room and using the actual sun. Uh, we just went down to the hardware store, Home Depot, and got a really, really bright 1500 watt uh, painter's light. And you move that around the spacecraft while simultaneously the spacecraft is hooked up to a computer and to make sure that the um that the spacecraft is sensing it correctly the other fun thing with doing this is the star tracker so the star tracker is, would be right here there's a little baffle on there uh, that, that's covering up currently on the 3d model and this item here is basically an iphone um, it's a very fancy iphone uh, that presents a star field simulation on it. And we put a lens in between the spacecraft and the star field to pretend that these stars are like light years away from the spaceship, as opposed to being just a, like a half a meter or so. And, um, and then the star field simulator rotates around um, the, the screen, the image digitally rotates. It's, it's stationary from a mechanical perspective, but it's twisting and turning and giving different imagery that the computers inside this star tracker are comparing all these points of light to a master database. And then it's also hooked up to a computer uh, so that we're able to see that the spacecraft is correctly orienting itself um, in relation to the various different uh, crucial stars. Now, what it used to do was it just saw dots, just saw these little spots of light, these little pixels, and then compared it to this huge database. And that's all it did. And said, yep, we're pointing towards Alpha Centauri or whatever. What we subsequently did in a flight so software update that we're currently running, we're on 5.0 right now, or um, but we'll, we'll be at a, a, an advanced one here shortly on the fl final flight software. Uh, reprogram the star tracker to raster across itself. So now it takes a picture. Um, and so this image is us in the clean room looking across at the spacecraft. We're probably uh, maybe seven meters away or something like that. At that and, and amazingly good resolution, uh, given that this was not meant to be a like a camera camera. Um, and so we expect to get really nice pictures uh, of the moon now and also the earth. Uh, one of the crazy things, you know, we're so used to having instant gratification when we take a picture, boom, push your button on your phone and there's the picture. Well, when I grew up, that wasn't the case that you had to, you took a picture and you sent your film away, um, you either mailed it away and it took a week to come back or, and then, then it, 
it, you were really happy. But then we got even fancier, and then you could take your film, and it was one hour photo, and you could get it and get it back. That's more what we've got here because it takes about thirty minutes to um, for the internal uh, processing of this image to occur. Now we didn't have to sit still for thirty minutes. It's not like an eighteen hundred camera where we had to sit still. This was a, a, a single single quick shot, but to process all that data into the computer. And then it took another 30 minutes out after that to transmit that data out. Um, so it's not particularly fast. We're not gonna be able to get movies uh, as we zoom across the, the moon, uh, but we will get uh, some pretty good pictures. Um, all right, so as we put this thing together, they were doing modeling and trying to understand more and more about the spacecraft at JPL. And they came to the conclusion that it's gonna get too hot. That all these electronics and the radios and the sun shining on it and everything is gonna make this part right here, the detector not work. It's gonna give too much noise, particularly when we're doing uh, the radios transmitting and, and receiving can also uh, damage those uh, as well. And so the solution was to put stickers all over the thing that were silver Teflon. And so that would promote radiant heating to allow it to, uh, to get rid of its thermal energy into the, the blackness of space. And um, so we put stickers all over it. Um, and hopefully that does the work for us. One other test, and this is the most terrifying test of all, uh, way, way more scary than the vibrational one. I call this the teeter-totter test or the saw test because what we did is we take the spacecraft and use the different, you know, the dreadnought to stand it up and whatnot. And then we let it, we put a, a fulcrum in the middle and then we let it fall over because we're trying to find the center of gravity. But we've got little brackets to stop it from falling completely over, but we still let it, let it shift a little bit. And so we did it on all the different axes and it was amazing how close the, uh, the calculated di center of gravity was uh, to the actual center of gravity, within, well within a, a percent on almost all, um, all, all measures. Um, the final spacecraft is 11 and a half kilograms. We are, um, I said earlier, it was a 14 kilogram spacecraft. That's actually our, our maximum mass that we can have is 14 kilograms. So we can conceivably put two and a half kilograms of fuel and, and still be within our 14 kilogram limit. Although, as I understand it, I believe we can only uh, physically fit two kilograms of, of fuel in there. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we're under underweight, which is a good thing for a spacecraft. Um, then the, some of the final steps we did, uh, so we did the, the vibe activity, which we call shake. And now let's do the thermal activity, which we call bake. And we send it through a variety of different cycles of temperatures of operational at hot, operational at cold, going through cycles and all sorts of different crazy scenarios that we could think of to see if it would work in space. Uh, one of the challenges we had was that Glenn's thermal vacuum, as great as it is, couldn't get quite cold enough um, due to the thermal mass. The, the, the spacecraft itself is, is, is pretty dense. It's pretty heavy. So it's a, you know, 11 and a half kilogram uh, solid thermal mass. We had to build this copper box uh, to chill down inside the thermal vacuum to get to our minus 10 um, test. But we ran, ran the tests at all the different temperatures. It worked great. And then we want to do a series of what are known as day in the life tests. And so these simulate um, the, the first few minutes and first few days of operation once we get dispensed out of the, out of the rocket. And then also um, simulate a, a, a typical orbital um, day as we approach the South Pole. We've done quite a few more other simulations in, in a variety of, of day in the life and fault protection testing just to exercise all the software. And uh, it's been really helpful because we've uncovered problems um, that we fixed with additional um, flight software. So, it's, you know, just 
if you can get as much time testing on the ground, you know, we never really want to see the launch slip to the right, which means getting later. But when launches slip to the right, that gives your ground operations team more and more time to, um, to work with the spacecraft and understand its nuances and, and uncover uh, these little um, glitches that if they were to occur in space, might not be able to get fixed. But since we're here on the ground, we can figure out how to fix them. The um, final effort is to make sure that the spacecraft fits out of the dispenser. This is the dispenser on the right that you see. And in zero gravity, it would just kind of push out on its own, um, spring loaded. Uh, but we're not in zero gravity on the Earth, and so it, it sort of slides. Um, but the main objective here is to make sure that there's no, it doesn't catch on anything. You can see a few of these removed before flight tags. Obviously, for the actual spacecraft, that will be removed. Um, and I forget what that one goes to exactly if that's the battery or whatnot. Um, but um, ultimately, we will take the spacecraft, put it in a Pelican box, then put it in a wooden box and drive it uh, about three and a half hours west of Atlanta to Huntsville, Alabama, where the Marshall Space Flight Center is. They will fuel it up there. Uh, and then uh, we've actually got two different boxes that are really the same box, same construction, but just have um, di different uh, labeling on there so that after it's fueled, uh, like I said, it's a bomb at that point. So you want to be really, really careful on that. These are, these are the operations uh, that we'll do over there at, at Marshall. And again, it's, it's just this wonderful team effort that we've had going on uh, between um, NASA and Georgia Tech. And so we'll take it over to Marshall. Eventually it gets fueled. And then we don't want it to come back to Georgia Tech. We want to send it right down to the um, launch pad there at Kennedy um, Space Center. This is the fueling facility uh, in, um, at NASA in Huntsville. Uh, it's actually bigger than this. This looks a little small. Uh, it's a pretty big room, um, but they've got a really nice propellant loading system, so we'll be very safe. It's, it's, it's complex. Again, you, you need to be careful with these sorts of things, but um, it's really good. And then once it's fueled, it goes down to Kennedy Space Center, and we'll launch on a Falcon 9 rocket. This video, hopefully you're able to see it. The sound is probably terrible. Um, this is the inaugural launch of the Falcon 9. Our launch will have a different looking capsule up at the very top of the rocket. The shroud will be a uh, different 10, size. Nine, eight, and seven. I'm gonna six, skip forward a little bit. And it launches and it goes up and it's awesome. And you're, we're, we're, we're gonna be watching. <laughs> This part right here, this where all the water looks like it's coming out, um, is, what, is what's called the surfboard. And so this this will be the location of where our spacecraft is. You can see it's very close to the rocket engine, but thankfully um, we're, we're shielded radiantly from there, so it doesn't get uh, exceptionally hot. And then um, the great thing about SpaceX is they land the rockets and use them over again, which is just crazy to think that you could take a rocket that's fallen out of the sky with fire shooting out of it uh, and, and land it uh, on a ship. And, and these pictures here are, um, the ocean is very calm. If you go on YouTube and, and look at other landings, they land this thing in, in, in with white caps with, with pretty substantial waves going around there. So it's a really advanced system. And I'm just thoroughly impressed that engineers even came up with the idea let alone are able to accomplish it uh, with great regularity. Um, so we'll we'll do that one. Do that, that'll just be be great. And then eventually it gets to orbit. Uh, once it's in orbit, or or not even in orbit, once it launches uh, and is released on its way to lunar orbit, uh, we begin communicating with it using, as I mentioned, the deep space network. Um, this is very beneficial to Georgia Tech to have done this project because almost nobody uh, in the academic world uh, in the United States has a connection to this deep space network. This is the network that NASA uses to connect with Voyager and Pioneer 
and probes on Mars and of course other things around the moon. Um, so this really gives us a great advantage. The only other institutions are Caltech, which um, California um, school that, that invented the deep space network back in the, I guess, 1960s or 70s. And then, um, then Johns Hopkins, uh, which is a big time user of the deep space network because they're operating a uh, Voyager and a variety of probes uh, on Mars. And then there's Georgia Tech. So we're in a really small club, uh, which gives us some great opportunities going forward. I ought to ask Glenn to step in and talk about this chart, but I'll try to do it myself um, because this is this is basically what Glenn is doing um, for uh, quite a few months um, after after launch. So once once the launch occurs, and again, this is the wrong rocket. This is the SLS rocket um, that we're not actually on now, but whatever. We'll launch on the Falcon 9, and almost immediately, within the first few minutes and hours, we have to do these trajectory correction maneuvers to put us on the right path to fly by the moon, um, but fly by the moon close enough that we are captured into orbit. And then that capturing into orbit takes forever. It's like four months. We'll zoom by the moon, probably come back by the Earth maybe a few times. Um, and ultimately we get captured into this um, near heck, the, the, the polar orbit around, um, around the moon. And as we go around the moon, you can see it's highly, highly elliptical. So we get within 10 kilometers, um, typically during the science orbits uh, at the South Pole, but then above the North Pole, we're way the heck out there, 65,000 uh, kilometers away. And while that thing is happening, again, this orbit takes about a week, a little less than a week. We're doing a variety of different things because this spacecraft has some nuances. So we want the lasers, that needs to be pointed at the, at the regolith, needs to be pointed at the moon as we go by on the South Pole. Simultaneously, or before that, we need to have our solar panels. This does not have the solar panels, but the solar panels need to be pointed at the sun. And then we need to point the radios at the Earth. And that's actually not possible to do uh, without taking the spacecraft and moving it constantly around and pointing it in different directions. And so that's what Glenn's doing, practicing with his team, is orienting, figuring out the command sequences and the timing and all that fun stuff of figuring out when we're pointing at the Earth, we can uplink um, uh, instructions to the spacecraft. We can, other times we can downlink the data from it. We're also uh, pointing it after we zoom past the, the solar, the, the South Pole, we want to charge up the batteries on the, um, on the, the, the lasers. And so there's just a, a tremendous number of steps. And then again, like, like I say, eventually after all the fun's over um, here after about, you know, half a year, two thirds of a year, uh, we got to crash it into the moon. Um, but that's going to be fun. We'll figure out a nice place to crash and hopefully we, maybe we'll put it near the Terminator and maybe we'll even see a cloud of dust from um, ground base or space based observations of the dust that we kick up and we'll be able to see more science by doing spectroscopy on that dust cloud. Um, the, I asked my student to calculate what um, size crater it would be. It's not going to be a giant crater. It'll be about um, about three meters across and about two meters deep. Uh, so not huge, but um, big enough that you'll be able to see it. Here's what Glenn's students are going to be doing instead of uh, celebrating New Year's Eve um, this year. So the first few minutes, um, we, we do a variety of different steps to, to basically uh, turn the heaters on and, and start charging the batteries um, and, and keep it from tumbling. Uh, and then we begin to do a series of operations where we desaturate the reaction wheels and, and get the, um, the propellant system um, ready, to, ready to be used because uh, very quickly within the process, we've got we've to fire our thrusters or the missions, I won't say it's over, but it's, it's definitely compromised um, if these trajectory correction maneuvers don't get done uh, very promptly and, and very succinctly. Hopefully we don't have to do very many of them so that we don't have to waste our fuel on this aspect of it and we can utilize the fuel 
later on during our orbital operations to uh, perhaps bring bring it even closer than than 10 kilometers um, because that will just continue to refine our observation capability. Hey, hey Judd, uh, you have about one minute, so if you oh, can. Oh, wow, I'm talking like crazy. Um, we've got certainly um, built-in uh, programming in terms of what we're going to do. Well, as it's headed out there, you're going to look at Jupiter. To It's a known IR source, so that'll help us calibrate the, um, the systems. Um, like I say, we've already got our baseline or our default measurement plan up, uploaded as part of the so software. Then after we do our lo lunar orbit insertions and know a bit more about our orbital um, mechanics and the dynamics, we'll be able to update that plan. And then as we continue to do these series of maneuvers, we'll be able to uh, get to the different um, just get a get a full map going. Um, the data, as I mentioned, uh, Georgia Tech is the Missions Operations Center. The Science Operations Center is UCLA, uh, and so we received the data at Georgia Tech. We actually put it in a, 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 a cloud-based network server that we call Box, uh, and then UCLA has built special plugins that automatically pull that data out of Box, and they put it into their models. Uh, and then um, do the necessary science. Really want to acknowledge the, the incredible team effort that we've had. It's been so fun working with, with Glenn. First of all, we, we've been friends and, and colleagues at Georgia Tech for a decade now, I guess, but maybe not quite that long, but trying to find some projects to work together and finally got a good one. And um, really do appreciate the funding from, uh, from NASA, as well as all the facilities that we have at campus. We've got a ton of students working on the effort. We've also got faculty working on the effort. And then we've got JPL folks that are actually coming from Pasadena to Georgia Tech, working in our labs and partnering with us. Um, and so with that, I think I've probably used up my final minute. I'm happy to take uh, any questions uh, that anybody may have. I will take this off so I can see people. Yeah, great job, Judd. Um, I don't know if we have time for maybe one question. Otherwise, people can contact you by email, which uh, that would be great. Yeah, and I'm happy to happy to stay on um, for as long as it takes. I mean, it's ten o'clock okay. at night here. Uh, still got another hour till till bedtime. So happy, uh, happy to take questions. Okay. And somebody somebody has raised their hand. Uh, it's in um, Chinese characters, so I don't know how to pronounce that. Unfortunately, sorry, but. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so good morning, professor. So I have two questions. So, so just like you say, it's a lunar flashlight spacecraft. They're laser. The color emission rate is a very high, and scatter rate is a very low. But my question is, so there's a something bevels and a bumps in the moon surface at the crater wall. This is not a smooth. So when it's a very high col color emission, in theory, when it's a high color emission rate, the laser light they put in putting down into the moon surface. The most strong, so that's like being a little bit flat into the other direction, it will be not back into the space crowd. Maybe the detector only can detect very weak, the very weak signals, so there's a scattering light, scattering light. So how do we fix this, this problem? Yeah, you're right. It, it is a very, very weak signal uh, that is bouncing back to the spacecraft. Now keep in mind, I did not design this spacecraft. This was designed by uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab. I'm really the mechanic putting it together um, on, for them. So I don't know, have a good answer um, to that. Barbara Cohen uh, would be the, the correct science uh, observer. And um, Glenn, do you have any yeah. comments on, on that? Uh, I, I'll just say, uh, you know, what enables them to get the, the signal to noise ratio that they need is that they have to fly very close to the surface. So that is why we are only 10 kilometers above the surface of the moon when we make these measurements. You know, we could not do this at Earth. The atmosphere, we would burn up in the atmosphere. The reason we can do this at the moon is because it has no atmosphere. So we're really just skimming over the surface as we make these measurements. But yeah, it is it is a weak signal measurement. Okay, so my second question is that because uh, you have to 
plays、uh, one movie、so、in your slice is about that、uh, very small、uh, faster in the satellite surface. So my question is that because since that faster will be produced a very high temperature, so all the metal will become very hot, reduce the red light. So that means their surface is very hot, will be produced the thermal radiation. But my question is, is that this thermal radiation they will be scattered in all direction, and because this the、uh, first this is slightly inclined, so will they cause the something mistake the、uh, prop proportions the power that we didn't want to that we didn't want this happening in the satellite maybe put the satellite in the wrong direction. Yeah. Well, one thing is the thrusters are over here on the spacecraft, and the detector is as far away as possible from that. Uh, the other thing is that the thrusters are not firing at the time that we're doing observations. Correct me if I'm wrong, Glenn, but it's it's probably quite a few. There's quite a bit of time between the last thruster firing and the observation, if I had to guess. Yeah, that's right. I mean, actually, we only do、uh, like four trajectory maneuvers, and the rest of the time we're mostly coasting.、Uh, so, should not. And the bulk of the orientation maneuvers around the. Moon when we're pointing, you know, the laser at the moon and the solar panels at the sun and the radios at the Earth is done by reaction wheels as opposed to the thrusters. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Okay, that was great. Thank you, Judd. That was really fun, interesting talk.、Um, so I, we're out of time. So if anyone does have any other follow-up questions, you know, feel free to email Judd or email me. I'll be happy to forward any questions you have. Thank you, everyone, for attending the seminar today. And we will be、uh, having another session next week. So I look forward to seeing you all、uh, next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reedy. Bye.